All right. Thanks, Christian. Oh, that was great. Christian explained the stuff that I used to explain in my talk. So I, now I can talk about other stuff. Um, <clears throat> like uh, oh, we're the secure share project. We're coming from the psych world, and uh, um, we chose GNUNE. Uh, we used to do federation, and uh, oh, we explained it. He, Christian explained it before. It's uh, with federation, you're essentially putting a lot of things on several servers. The idea was, the, the original internet was an, a nice idea, everyone has his mail server, everyone has his mail, web server, why are we putting all the stuff in with big companies if we can have our, our own servers? And, and in practice uh, that doesn't work very well because we're actually um, distributing even more trust to even more servers and then there's always the people that have no way, why should they choose a server? Why They get to the point that they're asked, now choose a server. And by which means should they choose a server to trust? And so they might be using some popular uh, trusted server like the Chaos Computer Club or the Pirate Bay or uh, something. Uh, but most of them will end up just taking the commercial offering from Google or from Microsoft. So even if you have a safe machine at home that doesn't help if the others are using Google. So, um, and, and it gets worse because uh, nowadays you can have a server for 8 euros a month. It's really cheap. Just go and get a server for 8 euros a month and um, well something that I'm, I've been waiting, like in the past weeks I, I got rid of all my paranoias because they all suddenly turned real and now I know okay it's that bad. Uh, for some reason it shocked me anyway, I don't know why. And uh, this is a little paranoia that hasn't been proven yet officially, but I bet it's only a question of time until we'll hear of this. This means you can get a server for yourself for 8 euros a month, it's so cheap because it's a virtual machine. So it runs on a, a big server run by a company, might even be a German company, but it's just a simulation running on this server and there are many ways, to, like you can install your own mail on it, your, your, uh, your uh, Jabber server, you can install all the software that you like to do on it and uh, the, the, you will not even find out that you're being controlled because you, it, the, the outer machine can give you bad random numbers like the random numbers aren't actually really straight random, that means that the cryptography sucks and your cryptography can be hacked. Or otherwise, it, the, the memory can be directly accessed of your uh, virtual machine. So, um, and an and a attacker can just, uh, that there, there has been released a paper that knows how to find a private key and memory automatically. So the private key can be extracted while you're just installing your software or your, your web server. You're installing a certificate for your web server. Well, the NSA already has the private key to your certificate so they can read all the traffic that is going to go through the server. Um, yeah, the controlling system can be accessible to these observers by means of the fantastic PRISM program. Um, so um, it is possible to have entire networks of people operating federated uh, social infrastructure or federated whatever, email, whatever, the whole network can be monitored. So that's not a good idea to actually think in terms of servers these days, it's just not, it doesn't work out. So we need end-to-end -end encryption, we need forward secrecy, okay, we got some software that actually already does that. And uh, we also like the GADs and we like the multicast, so that brought us to, all right, we need something like GNUnet. That's why we're working together with Christian and GNUnet. So what the hell, why multicast? Well, uh, Psyche used to be a chat and messaging tool and we always thought that sending one message to several recipients is, is essential and uh, some other chat systems do not solve this properly but we thought that's, that's actually one of the main challenges. And when it comes to social, uh, social uh, activity like the stuff you do on Facebook, each little thing you do is a message that goes out to several people. Like you send an update and it's to a lot of people. You send, you upload pictures and it's for all of your friends. And you, you distribute an article that you have just read. 
or you modify uh, data, your phone number in your profile. Well, we want this stuff to be on your device, on your computer, as soon as possible. Like if you going out of, away from the internet with your phone, it already has the new phone number of your friend because it downloaded it earlier. You don't have to be on the internet to look up the profile. It's not like for Facebook, you have to be online to reach, to get to the stuff. It's already on your computer. So we're distributing all the data all the time. And we need a good strategy for distributing. And the most obvious way to do it would be, okay, let's connect every other node and, and send a copy of our stuff. That's what uh, several, a lot of communication systems do. Just connect each and distribute the things. It gets terribly slow when you have a large number of people. You couldn't possibly do, let's say, a Twitter profile with it. Like if you have a Twitter with 1,000 people, you can't do it like this. Uh, the solution that the commercial world has done is they have a cloud. So what is the cloud? Well, you just connect to some endpoint and then the cloud magically does it and you don't know exactly what it does. Well, what it actually does, it, most clouds actually inside, they do some multicast and maybe we should do some multicast ourselves too. Multicast is actually very, very simple. It just means there are some nodes that will help me distribute the thing to other people. Whoa. Big deal, big surprise, why haven't they thought about it before? Well, it's actually a decades long uh, old idea, but it hasn't been implemented too many times. But there are some good examples, like BitTorrent works that way, that's why it works. <laughs> and uh, there's some peer-to-peer -peer television stuff that works that way. So uh, you can do big stuff with multicast. You can even distribute a, t a, a, a TV stream to a lot of people. So all you have to do is do it. And for some reasons, a lot of technologies do not do so. Uh, like email, email doesn't multicast. That's why if you're sending a message to uh, thousands of people, it will keep the server busy for a while. Uh, and uh, all the third is social web stuff like Jasper and Frenica, et cetera. So uh, you have a scalability problem. If that st stuff becomes popular, it stops working. So that's not useful. And, and it's always too late, like when it gets popular, you want it to keep working because you, otherwise you lose the people again. Another point is the multicast is something that works with several people, several nodes on the way, several hops on the way. It's very similar to what the onion routing does, like Tor, like GNUnet. It has a lot of nodes and it sends packets over several nodes. So it is a very similar way of, of operating the network, only that with Wildcast it's even more useful because it is meant for more people. So we can mix that, these two strategies. We can, have multi we can have things distributed just because they need to go somewhere really quick and it doesn't matter if it's, it doesn't have to be very obscure. And some other things which are supposed to be very private, so we have them hop over several hops. And to an observer, it all looks the same. You can't distinguish if it's just being social chatter going on or if somebody's telling something really secret to somebody else. So it provides social activity, provides for a lot of nice cover traffic. Um, another interesting aspect is that with the social graph, we get a new uh, dimension to uh, the onion rooting strategies because we get to have an idea of how much uh, one node is friends with other nodes like some people are friends on the first level some are like second level friends and uh, if if there's a node that you have no relationship to at all well you just might decide not to use it not to include it in your communication and uh, this creates a, a possibility for you to uh, have a, a server help you. So, hey, we get back to using those 8 euro virtual machines again. We take those 8 euro, 8 euro virtual machines and they just have the job of sending packets around because they're really good at that. If you take a server, it's, it has good speed, it's real reliability, it can store things while uh, the, the actual users are, are offline. So, that's kind of useful. And uh, it has a role, you can trust it because it's my server, because there's a social graph relationship to it. So we can speed up the way peer-to-peer uh, -peer stuff works, if we want to. <clears throat> um, 
So they broke the internet and we'll make ourselves a new one and I'll skip all the stuff that's on this list because I'll show some pictures instead. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, well the first step what we can do with a technology like that is, well, we can do some messaging, we can do some file exchange, so we don't need those companies anymore to do it. Um, um, next on we can do some social updates and we can share some media, so we don't need all of these companies anymore. And uh, maybe later we can do some applications on top of, of the social infrastructure that we have. That is pretty much what these companies are doing. They just have something extra put on the social layer. And uh, well, um, we can come to the point that we do more collaborative work on office documents, for example, or we can do location-based services uh, we can have a financial system on top of uh, these things, or we can do teleconferencing. So, well, we are reinventing the internet if we want to. And, uh, and we'll make ourselves a new internet. So, uh, what's with the business? Are we kicking all those folks out of business? Oh, well, um, I couldn't figure out a business model I was in a new economy 10 years ago. I couldn't figure out a business model that would make sense for maintaining freedom and privacy. As soon as you keep the software to yourself, that's a business model, but then it doesn't help freedom. But we can still allow commerce to, go, to happen on top of our free software. So if we build this for the platform, we can still have plenty of commercial content because you chose to subscribe to the, to the company that builds fantastic bicycles. And so they send you the, uh, the update with the new bicycle they built. But it's your choice, it's not spam. You chose to receive it. So the content can be commercial, but the code has to be free. Because basic civil rights have to prevail. So, we want free software, and we want free hardware. We want free devices that we know that's not, nothing wrong with them. We want a computer that really, we know what is, it is running. We put free software operating system on it. We put free software communication systems on it. And we want to be, have certification systems that ensure that this damn computer is free. And we want to get into politics so we can make laws that say you have to run a free computer in public administration. We want you to run a free computer in your lawyer office as a journalist. We want you as a doctor to run a free computer so it doesn't mess with the laboratory results of your clients. What we need is the political vision and the political will to do this. Thank you. I have a question and it is, um, well first you were talking like how evil servers are and how they can access the VM in memory and get the private key and everything and then later you were reintroducing servers as yeah we need them for social messaging and they can relay messages back and forth and I didn't get that part, can you explain that again? Alright, I have to be more clear, uh, the, thanks to the amazing software packages like Nunet or Tor, these uh, these nodes in between, they just do the job of shuffling, of sh sending things around without really understanding what they are doing. And if we apply a social graph logic, then they might know they are doing it for somebody who's vaguely in your social network, but they still don't know what they are doing and for whom they are doing it. And that's the, the, the essence, and that's totally different from how we are using servers today. Today, servers know everything about us, and we are totally relying on them with all of our, our private crap. And so it, it might, it would be useful, or it might be even better if we don't need them, but I don't know how, how well, we'll, how quickly we'll get there. If we want to have a, a faster network, it can be a solution. And the, the essence is they don't know what they're doing. I would like to know how do you want to finance free hardware and software? 
I want more political finance. <laughs> Go ahead, Christian. You have an answer to finance? No? He has an answer to finance. I was so oh, sure he would. <laughs> well, he hasn't given me much money yet. Just stress. So, um, I think, uh, hi. So I think that there are some interesting financial models, and I think that for free hardware, part of the problem is, well, what do you, what do we mean by free hardware? I mean, the free software world traditionally has had a really simple way of dealing with this, which is that every piece of object code you have, you have corresponding source code that allows you to create that object code, right? So that's really simple. But what is a resistor? Is that, you know, is that the equivalent of object code? Um, is it only the PCB when it's laid out? And there's this guy over here, the kernel, who is like the most, he's like the RMS of the hardware world. I mean that, you know, really, I don't, anyway, I'm not gonna dig up in this, I'm just gonna move on. But um, I think that if we look at the cost of the hardware, the initial cost that is the really big problem is the cost of actually having someone build the hardware, test the hardware, and then make sure that the software, the free software that we want to run, actually runs on it. And so I'm working on a project um, that is a free hardware project, actually, um, to try to take back the edge of the house. So you have a thing in your house, as well as um, some other computing devices. And the idea is to have free hardware where it's as open as is possible, as free as is possible in terms of op open documentation. And once it's actually finished, um, that is, once the initial investment has been completed and it has been paid for, then we have this thing. And all we have to do is fab it. And if you're able to put enough money together in a crowdfunding way, we can drive down the total cost of actually producing this because we can buy the parts um, basically in bulk. And the more we buy, the cheaper it gets. Because you do get economies of scale in this case. Um, so. It's difficult though, like uh, Sebastian's project, the Milky Mist, is a video mixer, and I found out yesterday, much or two days ago to my surprise, that he had only made 100 of them. So it's very sad when two people that aren't him were sitting at the table and had purchased this, because we thought it was tens of thousands, and um, he, should, he should have been making tens of thousands of them. But it's really hard to bootstrap that initial, initial process, but he did all the really hard work. And then at the very end, now we cannot buy them as easily, and that, that's kind of a shame. So if we solve the first part of the problem, and I think some of that is with research money, then the actual manufacturing part can be really simple and very quick and very affordable, where every person can put in just a small amount of money, and then they get something which they could never ever have by themselves in isolation. Um, and for the hardware project that we're working on, a few people, you should be involved in it too. Um, if you're interested in this, you should come and talk with me. I'm not really, I don't want to hype it or to announce it in public right now because of some complexity. Um, but I really think that this is a, a pretty straightforward economy of scale, and it's a pretty straightforward project that has really good returns, and then hopefully we can move it to being completely free, like no proprietary CPUs, for example, which is something that Sebastian has been working on with uh, the Milky Mist, and it's really impressive. But that means that there's a different cost we have to pay, and this is one which is not about fabbing the hardware, it's about actually being willing to put up with something that is running on an FPGA, which is an order of magnitude or two slower than an ASIC or a traditional CPU, which may have a backdoor in it. So there's some trade-offs that have to be made that are interesting, and it really depends on what you're willing to pay. If it's not money that is the issue, but it's your time, for example, maybe you will be very unhappy with the FPGA. So it's, it'll be great, though, when that's the problem we have, as opposed to maybe backdoor hardware or certainly backdoor hardware or proprietary software. Thank you. Any more questions? Oh, there's a question over there. Uh, just a quick note. Um, at the beginning you, of your talk, you outlined a threat model um, for virtual servers that you don't know if they're, co if they're compromised uh, when you rent them for 8 euros. And uh, there were just was a paper published a few days ago uh, about uh, doing a side channel attack on GNU PG from a second virtual server in this, on the same machine. Uh, so, with uh, this kind of research happening now, I think it's it's safe to assume that uh, all virtual servers are pretty much compromised, even if not intentionally by the NSA.
Okay. Jake? 